a top mass determination with um, jet grooming. Um, so let's start. Um, so I'm just displaying all the particle masses we know in standard model. And um, for reference, I've also put proton mass and the gold, gold nucleus mass. And uh, the heaviest is obviously the top quark. And so top quark is a very special particle. So it's the heaviest elementary particle. And it's the only quark that decays before it hadronizes. Um, and because of its large, large mass, it has the largest coupling to the Higgs boson. So it gives a dominant Higgs production. Um, it plays a very important role in BSM searches. Um, in a lot of places in this conference, we have seen uh, talks mentioning Z prime to TT bar. And um, it's also a great exercise in jet tagging when TT bar to Higgs and Higgs to BB bar. Um, so in this talk, um, uh, this talk is about exploiting jet physics, jet grooming for precision top quark physics. Um, so, so top quark has been measured um, and by various collaborations and, uh, and the uncertainty is quite small. But, and this is the experimental uncertainty, but this talk is about a different source of uncertainty. Um, we're trying to answer the question, what mass are we measuring these collisions? In other words, how precisely do we know the definition of the mass that has been measured at these, these colliders? Um, and the uncertainty in this, uh, the uncertainty I'm going to talk about is of the same order as the experimental uncertainty. So it's important to ad address this question. Um, so briefly motivating why we should care about precision top mass. Um, well, it's very important for, uh, for determining the stability of standard model vacuum. So in, in conjunction with Higgs mass, top quark mass and, uh, and mass can determine wh whether the electroweak vacuum we live in, is it stable or metastable? Um, and this plot shows that from the Harvard group that it shows that we are, we are on the borderline of stability and metastability. And um, it's very important for precision electroweak measurements. So this is a, and, and, and you can see, so the, the, the green ones are direct measurements of the top quark and the W, and the, and the w boson. And uh, the blue is the, in, the indirect global fit. So if you don't include the Higgs mass, you have the gray region. Including Higgs mass brings us to blue. But the point I'm trying to illustrate is that uh, there is a significant contribution to the uncertainty from top mass. Um, so the outline of my talk, so I'll basically go over uh, the problem of top mass, uh, per, per, top mass definition, and uh, I'll talk about what are the theory issues uh, one faces when one tries, to, uh, one tries to do a measurement in a precise top mass scheme at the LHC. Um, and then I'll talk about my, our work, uh, which utilizes soft drop grooming at the LHC. So, um, so mass is in quantum field theory. So like any other parameter in quantum field theory, it will get renormalized and it absorbs high energy divergences. Um, whoa. Um, so to be able to do more than one calculations, we need to know, we need to, def we need to get precise definition parameter we measure. So I'm talk we, we need to know what scheme the mass is defined in. Um, and so there is an interplay between theory, experiment, and simulation. So most precise measurements that, that I've displayed earlier, um, they directly relied on simulations or Monte Carlo uh, because it's hard, to, it, it's, it's hard to use theory directly in these measurements. And, uh, but, in, in, but the problem one faces is that it's hard to give a precise definition to the mass that is encoded in the Monte Carlo. Um, so, um, so just brief uh, review of what uh, what this mass scheme problem is about. Um, so you have a bare mass in the Lagrangian; it will get renormalized, and and so you'll have a counterterm, and you'll absorb a part of counterterm in your mass, and you'll uh, you'll have the self energy diagram, and you'll absorb the part of it in the counterterm and part of it in the mass, and that choice will determine what scheme you're measuring the mass in. Um, well, this way. Um, so for example, for pole mass, I'll, I'll absorb all of the self-energy term. Um, 
I'll put all the self-energy term, the counter term, and for MS bar mass, I'll just, uh, I'll just remove the one over epsilon poles from the self-energy term. And this is an example. It's a B quark decay width. And through this example, I'm trying to illustrate that the choice of scheme can affect the accuracy of your perturbative calculation. So the, the expression over here is the expression of decay width of B quark. And it depends on the mass of bottom quark to power fifth. And one and kappa two, they depend, these constants depend on what scheme I'm expressing the bottom mass in. And, and the epsilon basically tracks the order of perturbation theory. So you can see there are these three schemes. The one is where the B is measured in the pole mass or the MS bar mass. And there's the 1S scheme. Um, and you can see that I start with 1, and I, I go to 0.17, which is smaller than 1. But then the next order is not really helping me. I'm not, not uh, seeing improvement in my perturbative calculation. And the same story for them is bar mass, where the one loop correction is even bigger than the pole mass. Um, but you see some, something going on here, that the 1S scheme is giving significantly better convergence. And, um, and, and this 1S scheme has, is defined through the bottom, anti-bottom uh, potential, potential of bottom monium. And, and, and so this example is trying to illustrate that this choice of scheme can, uh, can really affect the accuracy of your measurement or your calculation. Um, so, yeah. The epsilon is one. Epsilon is just a parameter to keep track. And the, the, the reason it's there is because the mass scheme has an extra, for one S, it has an extra alpha in it. So alpha is not a very good, um, is, not, is not great to keep track. So you, you, need, you need to take epsilon also. So the, this, uh, this scheme adds another alpha. It brings down the mass. Um, so we can ask a question, what schemes are better or what schemes are worse than the others? Um, so let's go back to pole mass. So pole mass is basically defined by uh, mass be, uh, keeps all the terms in counter term. And for a full propagator, it'll still give you p slash minus m pole. So for, even for the full propagator, your uh, propagator will look like a free particle. And this is compatible with the bright Wigner. Just remove this annoying cursor out of the way. Yeah. More about this bright Wigner point later, but uh, but the problem with pole mass is that it's good for doing QED, but for for quarks there's a problem with pole mass in the sense that um, pole mass gets contributions from graphs such as these bubble graphs, and um, and I can have as many as n bubbles, and these. These far away terms in perturbation theory, they diverge as n factorial. And this is also called the Normalon problem. And that induces an ambiguity in the definition of pole mass. So you cannot define pole mass to an accuracy in perturbation theory to an accuracy better than lambda QCD. And this is not a problem in QED. Then you can ask, OK, the other popular scheme we know of is the MS bar scheme. Um, and in MS bar scheme, there is no such ambiguity. And, um, it's, it's of the class of schemes called the short distance mass schemes. Um, and uh, it is related to the fact that there is an IR cutoff in the integration, uh, which was not there when we did the calculation for pole mass. But the problem with MS bar scheme is that it's not compatible with the bright Wigner. So the top quark, um, it decays. It has a decay width of 1.4 GeV. And uh, so if you have a cross section where you ignore the decay of top quark, and uh, it depends on the parameter empty, so it'll change in this form, um, where s hat is dimension one parameter. And so let's say you want to improve your calculation from leading order to next leading order. Um, I will also have to include the next order correction in the mass. And then since delta mt is the, is the correction from renormalization of mass, I'll have to expand my bright Wigner. And when I do that calculation, I notice that this term, delta mt, is, is of order 7 GeV. It's much bigger than the width of the bright Wigner. So it completely swamps my bright Wigner. And it's no longer a small correction. Um, and for the, and, and uh, one can also see this from power counting arguments. Um, so that bright Wigner, the MS bar scheme is not compatible 
with Bright Wigner. And Bright Wigner is important for measurements where I'm doing kinematic reconstruction of top mass. Um, so more about that later. But um, so then you can ask, okay, what kind of schemes are suitable for kinematic reconstruction where I use the Bright Wigner? And so you can take the MS bar scheme and and keep the coefficients in the series of MS bar schemes and just replace the M bar, which appears over here, with, with a parameter R, with R, this, this R parameter that you can tune. And I'm gonna call, we're, we call the scheme the MSR scheme. And if you choose your R to be around order of gamma T, then you, then you, then you are still compatible with bright wigner And by choosing R big enough, then the non-perturbative scale, then you avoid the renormal problem. So then this, this scheme is one of the short distance mass schemes. And, um, and this scheme would be a suitable scheme for kinematic extraction. Um, and so this MSR scheme nicely interpolates between, uh, between the MS bar mass and the pole mass. Um, so the bright Wigner, as I said, is important for, yeah. These are the MS bar coefficients. So I do the dimensional regularization and um, I use the MS bar scheme to find my MS bar mass. And all I do is change the MS, so, MS, so the mass anomalization every term is proportional to mass itself. Yeah. So there's a relation between pole mass and the MS bar mass. Yes. The first relation? The R is R appears here. This bar map, I would have M. Yeah. These are the same coefficients as the MS bar coefficients. There's only one condition, which is MS bar and Yes. Yes. And I'm using those same coefficients. So what is this MSR? Yeah. Why do we care about MSR? You say MSR. Yeah. We This scheme, this this scheme, when I define my mass in such a way, um, I'm defining a mass scheme. How do you determine the coefficients? These coefficients are the same coefficients as you would get when you do an when you find your MS bar mass, and that you will determine by going back to a few slides ago. You do your calculation in dimensional regularization. You drop all the one over epsilon poles. You keep the finite parts. And those finite parts is a, it's a series in alpha. And, and those coefficients, I'm just directly using them here. Yes, yes, so. Yeah, so over here, in, my mu will go all the way up to R. And, and it doesn't spoil the power counting if I, if I make sure my R is order gamma t. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the, let's talk about the direct reconstruction methods, which are being used at the Tevatron at the LHC and the LHC. And the idea is that you have you have top quark and it decays, and um, and you you square all the um, the sum of momenta of all the decayed particles, and you need a, you need a hadronic decay of the top to be able to do that. Um, and so uh, these methods. Uh, one of the methods is called the template method, and and this method, these methods, they rely on the Monte Carlo simulations for templates, and it determines the best fit value of the Monte Carlo top mass parameter, and it's the value which I coded before. Um, so this is uh, relying on simulation to give you the top mass, and the, you can you can think of Monte Carlo as encoding a mass parameter of itself. And it will depend on the parton shower. So it is not kinematic one. It is uh, from the uh, fitting from the cross-section. No, this is a kinematic extraction. So I'll uh, I'll mention the full cross total cross-section. So this is this is relying on uh, this is reconstructing top jets. So do you see a peak. So this is not a total cross-section, but uh, but you can think of this mass encoded in the Monte Carlo. Um, it does not have an ambiguity as um, has been studied, and it is compatible with bright Wigner, but however, we don't know what the definition of this mass is. We don't know what the f precise field theoretic relation of the Monte Carlo mass 
to the parameters uh, of QCD. And um, so we're missing a link between theory and experiment here. Um, you can, yeah. That mass has a specific and meaning. This mass also relate what? Yes, and, and that's a problem. That is the question, and that's why that's why this study is there. Um, and so you can you can also compare theory and experiment directly without involving simulations. And this can be done for simple observables like cross section. And so you can write down your total cross section in terms of MS bar mass, and there is no problem of incompatibility with Bright Wigner because you don't rely on that. But the problem is that you get big errors because there you don't have a peak. Um, and so the shape is not very sensitive to the top mass. Um, so if you want to improve the top mass measurement at the LHC, we have to use a kinematic sensitive LH, uh, LHC observable. We need to express this in a theoretical, we need, to exp we need to know what definition of mass it is. So it's tractable in QFT. And we have to be able to control the contamination um, from the underlying event in the MPI. Um, and so, so, the, so the peak which you get from uh, kinematic reconstruction, it will depend on the, the original top mass which we're trying to measure, but it will be shifted from the non-perturbative effects and perturbative effects. So the first simplification we can do is to boost the top quarks so that we make sure that all the decay products, they, they are in the same jet. So, um, and so here what I'm illustrating is the, the theory issues, the list of issues one would face when one tries to tackle this problem. So we first need to define a jet observable. What is the observable that we are going to measure? And we need to, we need to be able to control what scheme we are measuring the observable, uh, the top mass in. There will be a problem of initial state radiation, the fi final state radiation. Um, there will be underlying event in MPI, which I call contamination. And there are also problems of color, color reconnection because now there are multiple channels. Um, there is beam remnant, there are part on distributions. And plus, now we are trying to tackle a multi-scale QCD problem. We have the energy of PT a very high, much bigger than the top work mass. That's the regime we are working in. And then the top mass is bigger than the, than the bright Wigner, which is, which is bigger than the non-perturbative scale. And so multi-scale QCD problems such as this will produce large logs of ratios of these scale, which will spoil your perturbation expansion. So one needs, we need to worry about resumming these large logs as well. And so we can, we, to tackle this problem, the, our first step can be to consider a simpler experiment of E plus E minus to TT bar, where a lot of these issues don't matter, and only the ones which are starred, uh, they are important. So let's... So this work uh, was, uh, was this work which was done eight years ago, um, nine years ago. And so let's ask ourselves, okay, what is the jet mass observable that we're going to measure? Um, uh, this would be a jet invariant mass. In fact, for E plus E minus collision, I can do much, much more, uh, I, can, I can totally do away with jets. I can ha define a thrust axis which goes through the two top jets and just measure the mass in each hemisphere. Um, so this, this was done in 2007, 2008. And um, so given the multi-scale problem uh, and problem of resumming these large logs, it makes sense to use uh, techniques of effective field theories. So we have three different scales here. Um, so to write down a factorized cross-section um, in, in QCD to, to tackle these problems with large logs, you will step by step match your QCD onto an effective theory, which is valid at that scale, which has the modes which contain the essential information at that scale. So you will start from QCD at scale Q um, to go to SET. So SET is a theory which is specially tailored for collider physics. Um, I mean, QCD is QCD. Uh, and QCD will describe phenomena such as neutron stars or microseconds after Big Bang or heavy ion collisions or or mass of proton, um, but we are trying to trying to like use this for a very specific task. It's like using Ohm's law as opposed to Drude's model for understanding how much current flows through your material. 
Um, and so, so SAT has been tailored for collider physics. And one of the special properties of SAT, you might have heard in the review session, is that it's um, in this effective theory, I distinguish quarks based on their momentum. A quark is always a quark no matter what its momentum is in QCD, but a quark going in this direction, in the direction of top, or in the direction of beam is now, is now distinguished. And uh, it reproduces, it has the essential information of the soft and collinear divergences. Um, and, and, but this describes if, um, and this has modes which live at, which live at the scale MT. Um, so they can have optionalness of order MT, but now we're interested in the peak region. And the peak region is defined is to the, the jet mass that I measure. I want it to be close to the top mass. So I want it to, I want myself to be within the bright Wigner region. And so I have to go one more step from SCT to match to the heavy quark effective theory. So this theory is, uh, has been uh, historically st studied for heavy quark systems, where you have a heavy, qu heavy quark mesons, where you have a heavy quark whose mass is much bigger than the non-perturbative scale, and describes the stuff wiggling around this heavy quark. And uh, so we have two boosted copies of heavy quark effective theory, which are, which are being matched to SCT. And using this formalism for, this, uh, for the hemisphere mass, we can, we can write down a factorized cross-section, which I'm displaying here. Um, and this cross-section has different pieces, and the very, every piece of this cross-section uh, comes from, diff, has, has contribution from modes which live at different scales. Um, these are the matching coefficients one, one gets when one matches from QCD to SCT at scale Q. This is the matching coefficient one gets when matches, one matches from this SCET, the soft collinear effective theory, to the heavy quark effective theory at, at scale m, and and the but these are numbers. The part which really affects the shape, which is important to us, is the is the jet functions and the soft functions. And these these jet functions, they they contain the collinear radiation, um, and they ha they are. They're, they are written down in terms of modes which contain the sensitive information of the mass scheme. So the, it, it is over here where you're able to specify a mass scheme, a suitable mass scheme. So the, 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 the biggest the point takeaway is that you are able to control a mass scheme and you're able to sum large logs between all the different scales. And yeah, and there's a soft function which describes soft particles which are not really, which not necessarily in line with the jet. Um, and so using this cross section, now one can actually understand the perturbative and the non perturbative parts of which shift the peak. Um, so you're measuring a mass M peak and you will be extracting this, but now you have understanding of what is the perturbative shift. And there's a way to control the non-perturbative shift um, by including a model parameter in your in your uh, in your soft function. Yeah. And um, so this calculation was done at next to leading log prime, uh, which is next to leading log accuracy, and you include order alpha as corrections. Uh, we extended this calculation to, which is essentially next to next to next to leading log. Um, and um, this was a very exciting project. Um, at, uh, the fact that all the pieces in this cross section were known up to two loops, but um, except for a very, in, uh, except for this matching coefficient between SCET and the BHQAT, um, and uh, this was a very interesting calculation because it involves top bubbles, which makes you think really hard about the power counting in the scales, um, because. When you are in BHQT, you don't know about the top mass, which you have integrated out. But the top bubbles, they do show up, and they bring the mass scale in it. And so, um, but having done that, this is, uh, we are about to finish this work. Um, and what I'm showing is that um, I'm, in the green, you see the leading log, and the next leading log in the red. And you can see that um, the, I have an estimate for the errors. So the cross-section depends on the renormalization scale. Uh, mu, and this mu should not, mu is not a physical parameter, but um, so I know that if I change my mu, my final answer should not change because the physics de doesn't depend on mu, but by changing mu, my answer will change numerically, and that gives me an estimate of the uncertainty. 
So the higher order calculation I do, the, the lower, the smaller, the smaller the number of terms that I'm ignoring, and the uncertainty gets small from green to blue to red. Um, so this, this work has also been used by my collaborators in the top mass calibration of Monte Carlo. So this is an effort to understand what mass is encoded in Monte Carlo simulations. And this involved uh, fitting the cross section um, at next to leading log to, to Pythia, to theory, um, at different energy scales. And then using that and using different mass schemes, you're trying to answer what does this Monte Carlo mass look similar to? And the conclusion they derived is that Monte Carlo mass does not look like M-pole. However, looks, it's very compatible with an MSR mass of this R1 JV cutoff. And um, so, uh, which brings me, now we go to the second part of my talk, um, the top mass determination at the LHC. Um, so having done this calculation in E plus E minus gives us confidence that, okay, we can do, we have, we have, the, we have set the foundation and um, now we are ready to tackle a complicated problem. And um, now all these issues matter. Um, and so we need a factorization theorem uh, sophisticated enough to handle all these issues. But I should mention that there is no star here for underlying event in MPI. So this is beyond the scope of factorization theorem. So we would still need to be able to handle this. Um, so we did this work. We extended the factorization theorem for E plus E minus to proton protons. And it schematically looks like this. And this is more sophisticated than the one you have seen before. Um, but it has, it, has the, it has the relevant machinery to, to handle most of the other problems. So it, these i's, uh, which are part of the beam functions, um, they, uh, they describe the initial state radiation, the perturbative part of the initial state radiation. And you also have the PDFs in it. And you have the same jet functions, which, which I had in my E plus E minus case. Um, and you are able to control a beam veto. Um, and one interesting property of this cross section is that um, up to two loops, this cross section, um, uh, this, this beam function part, the part coming from the beams in the collisions, that factors out. So I can work with normalized cross section. Um, and um, to handle the contamination, uh, which I mentioned, the underlying event, you still, you have to account it through a model. But there was a study done by um, Ian Frank and Wouter, uh, where, which, uh, where they, where they came up with a very interesting observation is that I had a model parameter which, which, I, which I had to tune to account for my hadronization in E plus E minus. I can take the same model and, and, and use the same model to tune the same model to also account for the underlying event in MPI, which is not part of my factorization theorem, but this can still be described. And um, they showed that this depends on just one parameter, omega, which is the first moment of that model. And this omega sets the dimension scale of how much non-perturbative shift is there. Um, so in this plot, you see that dashed is the partonic pythia. Um, and you're looking at um, quark gluon initiated z plus one jet. Um, so you're measuring the z jet. And you're looking at the mass of, uh, you're looking at the mass of the, this is the massless jets initiated by the massless quark. Um, so this is the partonic. And if I include, if I, if I turn on the hadronization in MPI, so we'll be playing this game a lot, which really uh, to see like, okay, what are the different effects of hadronization and MPI? But if I turn them off, my peak shifts. And um, I can account for the shift uh, by using the same model function. So the, I should mention that hadronization is part, is, uh, can, there is a def, you can still handle hadronization and factorization theorem. But, um, but not MPI, but you can still use the same model function to account for that shift. Um, but however, this is still not good enough because uh, what I'm showing, uh, because the contamination to MPI is, is, is rather huge. Um, what I'm showing in this plot is um, I have the partonic pythia where I've turned off the hadronization in MPI. Um, by the green, which, and it's very close to the dashed vertical line, which is the, my input top mass. But if I turn on the hadronization, the peak shifts to blue. But turning on to MPI has a rather dramatic effect. And uh, it's not ideal to have such a large shift from the contamination. That needs to be modeled. 
Um, so that requires a second simplification, and so that's why that's where we turn to jet substructure techniques um, to deal with this. Um, so we will be using jet grooming to reduce contamination, um, and the grooming technique uh, we'll be talking about is the soft drop, and uh, as Jesse mentioned, probably missed part of the beginning part of the talk, but um, with soft drop, you can actually do precise QCD calculations. And so we turn to soft drop, and, um, and what soft drop, briefly reminding you what it does, is that you t it takes the jet as one object and it declusters the jet based on Cambridge Aachen algorithm. So you have a clustering history, and then you, and you walk through the clustering branching history, and at every branch you ask, is this branch soft enough that I can ignore it? And you can, you can incorporate an angular dependence through this parameter beta, so if, I, if my beta is zero, then I'm only comparing the energy, but if I increase my beta, then I'm more likely to keep collinear particles um, than the wide angle particles. So this grooming will help you uh, chop away the, the soft radiation. Um, and as, show, as was shown by um, Jesse and collaborators, that you can actually do uh, QCD calculations for soft drop because it's an IRC safe observable. So this is your groom jet mass. So this is your jet mass after grooming, and they're they're looking at different betas here, um, and it reproduces uh, pith here rather well. And um, but the next step would be okay to really deal with the multi-scale QCD problem. Uh, one needs to be able to write down an effective theory, like we did um, for the case of groom jet mass. And we build upon the work from the Harvard group, which, which Jesse specifically mentioned um, in the talk today, is that in this, in this group they considered massless jets, um, and they were able to write down a whole factorization theorem um, for the massless jets once you have applied jet grooming. And it's, a, it's not a very easy task because when you apply soft drop, it introduces more scales in your problems because of Z-cut and, and um, and, and beta, and the, and the idea is that you're chopping away wide angle soft modes, so, but those soft modes were there before I groomed my jet, but once, once I apply soft drop, they're chopped away, but only to the extent of the aggressiveness of the groomer. So you don't chop away all the soft modes, but you chop away part of it, and so what it does is that it adds, um, it, it brings new modes in your theory, which are also collinear, but also soft, and, um, and adds a new soft collinear function. And, um, and they did the study for um, energy correlation function E2 alpha, and E2 alpha for alpha equals to two um, is nothing but your jet mass. Um, and this diagram is basically showing you, okay, so the, the, the axis is inverted. So you have one over z cut and one over theta. So this is more soft, going this direction is softer, going this direction is collinear. And, and the line, black line is, is the soft drop line. So the modes, um, uh, modes which, which live above this line will be chopped off. And, um, and, and effective theory hel helps you handle this because as I mentioned, SCET treats modes differently. A quark with this momentum has been treated differently than quarks with that momentum. You have separate fields for that momentum. So effective theory techniques very nicely help you um, describe this system. Um, and one of the biggest consequences, which also has impact on discriminating quarks and gluons, as Jesse mentioned today, is that it isolates the jet. When you, when you groom your jet, it isolates it from the rest of the event, and, um, and you're able to achieve NNLL precision. Uh, and um, so we, so having learned about this work, and we are able to, um, we, we are, so we built upon work to describe top, top mass with jet grooming um, in case of LHC collisions. So um, the first step towards that would be to ask, okay, what modes are in my theory? Um, to write down an effective theory, you need to, you need to answer three questions. One is your symmetries. Uh, what are the symmetries in my theory? What are, the, what are the different modes, and what's the power counting? And all these three change uh, when, you, when you consider a different effective theory, when a different observable, because for every observable, you'll have different modes contributing to it. 
Um, so if you just consider a top quark emitting a gluon, and let's say this gluon has energy E, and ang emitted an angle theta, um, I can ask, OK, in order for this gluon to contribute to my measurement, by, by, by my measurement, I mean uh, measurement of mass in the peak region. Um, so this is M, and this is the peak. And I'm basically, I want my jet mass to be in this region, which I call the peak region. So to, for this gluon to fall into this peak region, um, it has to satisfy this constraint, which you can derive by kinematics. And, um, and then now I'm also introducing soft drop. So um, what, what I want my soft drop to do is to chop away as much wide angle modes as possible. And that's good because if I have my top jet here, there will be wide angle modes, wide angle gluons emitted by the top quarks, but there can also be stuff coming from outside. And this will also be considered a wide angle mode. So, so to chop away as much as possible is good for us. But we do not want to chop the, the collinear modes. And they are to the jet function, which I showed before. Because those collinear modes, they contain the sensitive top mass information. And, um, and this was a quite surprising result that we found, that when you apply these constraints, it rather puts you in a narrow region for this parameter z cut. And if you look at this value, this is order 1%. If typically experimentalists use z cut of order 0.1, but this will show you that this is too uh, too aggressive, because I mean you have a top jet and you can use as as any z cut you want and you will get a peak, but the problem is um, if you go too aggressive, you're chopping away you're you're chopping away the information the modes which contain the so, uh, the top mass scheme in it. Where this? This is oh this M. This is just the top mass. This is just. I mean this is um, order same arguments. So um, if I if I change this M, if I add another gamma t, that will be gamma over M expansion correction to this guy. Um, and I'm already very, I'm already like using a lot of sims in this graph. So the dashed lines, they are basically um, replacing these inequalities by equalities. So the conditions are equal at these dashed lines. And the solid lines are satisfying these inequalities by a factor of one third. Um, yeah, that's a very important point. You at lower PT region, you're not allowed. You cannot use jet grooming to to control the top mass scheme, um, and that's one consequence is that you have to use light grooming, and you're limited to rather high PT region. Um, and um, you will lose statistics. Yes, substantially. You will use statistics substantially. Yes, um, but um, that's what power counting tells you. Um, and um, and so I'm, I'm displaying a similar diagram as I showed in the slide when I talked about the Harvard group paper, is that um, this blue line is, uh, is your peak constraint. So we want the modes to live on this peak constraint. So they can be soft, but they, their angle has to be such that they're on this blue line. And previously, we had mode, modes which were all the way here, which were not collinear at all, which were wide angle modes. But now they get chopped away, and you are left with the collinear soft modes. Um, that's right. We want to know what mass scheme we're measuring. That's true. Yeah. So, so I mean, yeah. Does it become a game of uh, diminishing the return? Yeah. So this already limits you to PTs of 600, 700. So the plots I'm going to show are top quarks with PT bigger than 750 GeV. Whether that also yes, for my huge number of top quark players that we are always advertising. Yeah. How many? Are, what fraction is? 
This this um, this is a rather small fraction. I am I don't I mean we can we can go back and look at the PT spectrum which I showed in this this. So we are we are talking about 750. So we are here. So um, so this is 10 to minus 2. So you're you you have a factor of 10 or yeah. But that's also the constraint from effective theory that. You need a separation of scales, no, so yeah. I'm, I'm being this yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, no, I'm, I'm on. No, it's it, it's cool that you thinking ahead and asking great, uh, fun questions, um, in a friendly way. <laughs> um, so um, where were we? Okay, so. Um, so this, this after having looked at what the modes, what modes are there, and um, understood the power counting and different energy scales that come in because of soft drop grooming, you can write an effective theory. And this is a um, schematic that I made um, in my new iPad uh, that how how your um, uh, effective theory structure is going to change when you have soft drop. So now um, instead of BHQT. I'm writing BHQED plus, and the plus is basically, it, it goes back to the convention that floats around in the SCED community, is that uh, you no longer have the soft mode, but you have a collinear soft mode. And, um, and, and your soft modes, which, uh, and you, you only keep soft modes which are energetic enough, but they don't contribute to your measurement. But what I want you to see, um, and what you wanted to take away from this, uh, this diagram is that, over here, I had the soft crosstalk between top and the anti-top. So at T minus, I was only I was able to describe only those systems where both the tops decayed hadronically because both of them were talking to each other. I couldn't be ignorant about the other top. But what jet grooming does is that it isolates the top quark and it allows you to treat them independently. So now you can even do semi-leptonic decays. So you use one of the leptonic decaying top to tag your event and, and use the other guy to measure the mass. And this is the factorization theorem that I'm displaying here. Um, becomes more and more messy. Um, um, and, but it still has the same jet function. But the soft function has now has not been changed. Um, and you also have a model function. So if I vary my beta parameter, uh, we can also ask how these constraints change. And, and if I reduce my beta, I'm being more and more aggressive uh, in my grooming. And you can see that. Uh, that rather squeezes you uh, even more if I increase my beta. And this is my peak region, so it also matters uh, what the jet mass is measured. Okay, so I've fixed my PT over here to 750 GeV, and the constraints will also change with where I am in my spectrum. Um, uh, modes which live here, modes which contribute to this, this area of jet mass, Will be, will, will be affected differently by grooming than the modes which live here. Um, okay. Um, and one interesting study we did um, with something we found was uh, having to do with the uh, groom jet radius. So um, um, this was uh, so what groom jet radius is that um, when I have my soft drop, um, uh, soft drop procedure. When I when I act soft drop procedure on a jet, I start with the branch. I start with the jet. I I go to the first branch and I keep going. But soft drop stops the first time the soft drop criteria is satisfied. The first time it finds two branches uh, which are comparable in energy, the soft drop will stop its grooming, and that angle or radius will define the groom jet radius. So I start with the jet this big, and I'm basically I, I groom it away. And I stop here. And for top quarks, this has a very interesting structure. So this study that was done in Jesse's paper, they considered massless jets. Um, but for top quarks, it's interesting because the groom jet radius is set by the decay products. And it's something you'll see even uh, later on in the, in, in, in the plots that I'm going to show, um, is that I can chop away the soft particles, but eventually I'm going to hit the decay products themselves. And that's where the soft drop will stop. And and that makes me rather, uh, and, and so what I'm showing here is that I'm showing different, I'm showing the spectrum of RG, the groom radius, 
um, for, for different PTs. So these are the highest PTs, and, and, and I'm reducing the PT as I go down. And so if I have, if the PT is large, then the, when the, then the, the, group, the decay particles are more collimated, they're closer to each other. So that makes the groom jet radius smaller and smaller. And you can see, um, and the different colors are, based, are changing. Okay, so it's hard to read, but this is different Z cuts. So I'm going from red to blue. I'm starting with Z cut of 0 0.001. So this is 0.1% level grooming to 10% grooming. So at 0.1% grooming, I'm, I'm barely able to go inside the jet. And the soft particles, they sort of, they give you a peak. So this is jet of radius one. And it's, I start my grooming and I'm, I stop here. Um, but if I increase my Z cut, eventually the soft particles, they start to give away. But then I get a second peak, and that second peak has to do with the decay products, is when I hit the decay products. And then you can ask an interesting question, um, how does this peak change if I change my PT? And, and, that, and, and it's very obvious that if I change my PT, if I reduce my PT, the, the angle is going to go bigger, and the peak is going to move. And, uh, and this is actually very important because this, this information was actually used to derive key ingredients of factorization theorems. Um, the, the, the problem of where does the non-perturbative mode lie in your spectrum, that is very much dependent on um, how fast or slow this peak moves. Um, so now I'm going to show you some Pythia studies to, to illustrate, uh, uh, to test the predictions I've made from our intuition so far. Um, so first is the Z-cut dependence. So this is my top quark jet. The black dashed is what I get without any grooming. This is the same graph which you saw before. Um, and as I increase my grooming from 0.1% to all the way to 20%, you see there's a sudden jump. There's a clear transition. And it should not be surprising because eventually you're going to hit a decay product. And decay products have substantial energy. They have about 30% energy. And if I increase my if I make my groomer more and more aggressive, it's not going to do anything more. Um, and, and that's why I'm seeing a peak here. I, my peak stops moving from this point. Um, but one also interesting, one point that is very interesting is um, I'm able to get a very sharp peak already for very, or like one person level grooming. So we should not be discouraged that we are limited to light grooming. Even this very light grooming is able to make a clear distinction, uh, give, give a much sharper peak. removes most of the contamination. So this peak gets closer to the input top mass in the Monte Carlo. Um, another interesting consequence is that it's independent of the radius, which is what we expect. We expect that it should make, the grooming should make the top work independent of the rest of the radius, and you see that here. Well, at some point, if I re keep reducing my radius, I'm going to start affecting the decay products. But, um, but you see 0.7, uh, beyond 0.9, there's barely any change in the spectrum. Whereas without soft drop, you don't even have a peak. I mean, it, can, it keeps going up. Because increasing the radius, you're including more contamination. Um, I also, we also predicted that the, uh, the radiation outside the jet should be independent of the cutoff. Which you see here that so what I have, I have my two top work jets. And um, what I've done here is what we did here was to, um, to also run the anti-KT algorithm on the same event. And anti-KT will find uh, as many jets and put a PT cut on all the jets other than top work jets. So the higher the PT cut, the more contamination I'm letting in my, in my event. But you see that the peak is quite stable. Um, and it's almost, and the shape is exactly, pretty much the same as um, no PT veto. So that, I should mention this is a normalized plot. So I'm losing my statistics as I put PT cut. But um, um, so the, the actual height is different, but the shape is quite similar. And now this brings to a very interesting uh, consequence of using jet grooming on top works, is that soft drop predicts that you should get the same result for E plus E minus in PP collisions. And is that really true? We can test that. So if what I'm showing here is without soft drop, I don't apply a soft drop to my top work jets. 
So the blue is my e plus e minus, um, and, and the red is my proton, proton full. But if I turn off the MPI, it's something you saw before, it jumps to the green curve. Um, they look similar, but they're not quite the same. And especially MPI has a, the, MP, the underlying event has a big effect on the, on the jet mass spectrum. But this is what happens when I turn on soft drop grooming. You see that the, both the E plus E minus and PP, at least when I have the hadronization, they're spot on. And even if I turn on MPI, the, the, shift, the shift is much smaller. So this is telling you that the contamination is much smaller. So this is promising. And uh, this brings me towards the last part of my talk where, we can, uh, where we're doing a preliminary comparison of the simulations to our theory. Um, and so the, 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 the idea, of, idea is that I can turn on and off my MPI. And, um, and so, I, so this, we're not really working with data. So we have Monte Carlo. We can do that there. So this is an attempt to calibrate the Monte Carlo mass. Um, so this is my, the red is my, so the blue is my Pythia. And I can pick a top mass and, um, and, a, and a parameter which sh tunes my shape, the, the model function, um, uh, so that I, I, I tune it to the, to the Pythia curve. Um, and the dashed lines, they, they are the, they're the region where I fit it, because this is the peak region. I'm not really uh, confident. Uh, my theory doesn't work very well beyond, beyond the dashed lines. Um, and so without contamination, I get uh, 171.8, and the Monte Carlo mass is 173.1. Um, what this plot is showing is that if I turn on MPI, I only need to tune my model function, and I can keep the, keep the input theory mass the same. Um, and you will expect a change, but uh, and and the hope is that this will be we will be able to do the study at different energy scales, and do a calibration of Monte Carlo uh, for PP. Um, Um, I mean, the initial energy and the... PDFs, the high scatter So the PDFs, as I said, they can, they, they drop out. So the big problem with PDF is, is already solved, is that I can, I'm showing you normalized cross-sections. And even if I don't apply soft drop, and I can already factor out my PDF. So, um, and as far as other scales in QCD are concerned, effective theory is sophisticated enough to, it's designed to, to handle all of that very systematically. Um, um, and here I'm showing uh, the level of uncertainties you get when you change the, when you change the renormalization parameters, um, the mu parameters. Um, and we're still working on uh, translating this theory uncertainty to the uncertainty in the fit parameters. Um, and as I said, I mean, so I've, I said that in the, in, the, in the slide before, one of the slides before I mentioned that you can describe the MPI, you can tune the MPI or hadronization only through one parameter, uh, omega one. Um, but I'm also using this another parameter, x2 over here. What this x2 is, nothing but it's just a ratio of the cumulants uh, divided by omega one to raise to that power. So, and this is done to make sure that omega one contains the the dimension of the scale, and um, and the higher moments are encoded in this dimensionless parameter, and uh, the dependence on this these parameters is rather small. So this is giving you a confidence. This is giving you confidence that you can you can even fit the data. You can even fit the theory directly to the data, just using two parameter fit. Uh, one would be the MT, and other would be the omega one. Um, however, this is a preliminary conclusion, but we do hope that we will eventually go in that direction. Um, so this brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, so we talked, and, and just want to mention that um, 
with this two-parameter fit that I mentioned, it might be even possible to compare theory directly with experiments, as people do for the total cross-section, but now for the first time for a kinematic extraction process. Um, or you can calibrate your pith as what Monte Carlo mass is there. Um, this study was done for E plus E minus, but do we really know that there's a same mass in E, in e plus E minus as opposed to PP? Um, so um, just summarizing the talk, uh, we talked about a very important question, what mass are we measuring in these experiments? And um, and how do we, and, and we need to get answers by connecting theory to either simulations or data. And I presented a promising new method to measure top work, um, exploiting soft drop. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, that was the main conclusion. I mean, that was a big point even Jesse mentioned today that it isolates the, the jet. So that the Harvard group showed that it gave us confidence to, to work upon. I have, um, well, let me think about that. So there will be non-global logs, uh, at least for no soft drop, there will be non-global logs, uh, but you won't see them until two loops. That was a conclusion that was, uh, that came out of a study that, by looking at a very similar observable of NJDNS uh, on um, Higgs plus one jet by my collaborators, and uh, they showed that the non-global logs they don't show up until two loops. And, and so this, I mean, there, we don't have order alpha as corrections yet. So in this study, you're not gonna expect. Um, so for, for the, no, for the no, if I don't have any grooming, um, my soft function will have non-global logs because it is trying to connect four different sectors. My guess is that you will not have some of those non-global logs, but I don't quote me on that. I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so we haven't, yeah. Because they have been actually had very, you know, clear evidence that there was a period of time. And if it was what kind of observables were there? were new ratios. These are the famous new ratios that they used. They cannot raise those observables. Mm -hmm. They cannot raise those observables. Okay. And I mean, they are actually the ones who go back against the usual changes that we call the ratios of that. Okay. They become, they're, they're similar to the normal. I see, I see. That's what I meant by new ratio. I see. And, I mean, this was part, this was also, sort of at that time, looked at by uh, Fred Moff and Company. Yeah, yeah. So I am just curious, and that's what I'm asking on the CBA. I mean, basically, the point is now to break that there's a lot of work has gone in. Now, if one wants to really estimate what is the value that is being added to the next, uh, you know, you also kind of Yeah, do the do different theory 
different PDFs or or is it some? I have no idea. No, the, no, the June don't have them. Yeah. Okay. June they are only the underlying the event. Yeah. Yeah. Process. I mean, that has nothing to do with. Okay. That's why I said. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm just curious whether that's going to be No, 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 we don't. I mean, we don't, we don't expect at this level I mean, at all, at NLL. I accept that. Okay, I mean, that's why we do normalize. That's why we always look at ratios of ratios of ratios. Right. Ratios. And that's clear. But now it's like, what are the people that are Yeah, that would that would have to do with like okay, what are the errors on this parameter yeah, omega? That, that would be yeah, and and that is a problem that we are tr still trying to tackle. Um, we 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 still don't understand how soft drop behaves at low PT, and so at lower PTs and um, the soft drop, the Pythia curve doesn't seem to change, and the theory changes, and um, whereas you should be able to fix this omega one once for all. Because it doesn't care what PT of top course is, and you should be able to use it for all different PTs. Um, so, still trying to tackle that problem, and that that is related to this point I made that we have these theory uncertainties. We we still have, have to do work to translate into errors on these numbers over there. Um, okay. Yeah, and that could change the spectrum, even if you normalize. That would really then, basically, I guess what my, finally what I'm getting at is trying to get a number as to what is the theoretical error that we have Two, three GV, yeah. Earlier numbers were 5 GV, and now with the current measurement of LHC, and you go down to 2 GV. Yeah. I haven't really followed the Yeah. The Swellmock and collaborators calculated that. From Severtron, and it was 5 GV. So I'm basically trying to see what is really my final gain that I can We should definitely, yeah. GV. Whether I really come down to 0.7 GV, that's here I'm learning, or is it? Or like 1.2 GV. I guess I'm just trying to... Try, no, I mean, that's a... Uh, and we, we, we do understand that we don't know a priori if Pythia is treating uh, top course the right way. You know, Pythia, could, there could be something in Pythia, the way it showers, or, or... And it might... It, so the, See, you're doing something nice here, that you are saying that I have a pure theory calculation, and I'm trying to get the hang of what my generators are doing by comparing... I think it would be because I take ratios with the yeah. of that. So therefore, can I now change the generator? You know, this is going to Yeah, no, that definitely. And also, the PT spectrum is is important to address because uh, that's something we are struggling with right now. As I as I said, this this red curve will will stay here, and the blue moves away. And I'm like, okay, and we we don't understand why, um, and and that could be something in Pythia. Maybe real data. Jesse's plot showed us that when you change qualifier, change completely, then you went from one generator to another. Yeah. But on the other hand, the relative order in the measure. Yeah. Therefore, I imagine that the quality would change the order in the measure. Yeah. And the question would be does this 0.7 difference that you see right now in your field, 200, does it become 1.5? Yeah. 
True, true, true. And and now we are we are doing grooming, so we are even sensitive to the branching, uh, the the showering, and that definitely needs to be checked. 